So thank you everyone for joining. Um, I am super excited to be moderating this event, um, especially because it is so important to talk about uh, Arab American Heritage Month. And I'm super excited to also um, be uh, accompanied by these lovely panelists as well as our embassy staff today. So um, yeah. And um, I also wanted to thank everybody for joining us and um, taking time out of their day to be here, um, as well as our panelists. And I also wanted to thank the embassy staff that has worked so diligently on uh, this uh, event and discussion um, and for us to come together and to share experiences as well as to learn more about Arab American culture as well as just, you know, sharing kind of like community and, um, sense of togetherness. So without further ado, um, I would like to present Daniel with our opening remarks. Hello, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, a special thank you uh, goes out to our panelists uh, for today. So we have with us uh, Sahar Al-Ansari, uh, Aya Abu Naba, uh, Luaya Khresh, and Dr. Isam Haggi. Uh, so thank you guys for joining us for tonight's special discussion and celebration of Arab American Heritage Month. Uh, just a few words uh, just to open the uh, session. Uh, Arab Americans as a demographic actually make up 1% uh, of the United States population. Uh, there are currently first, second, and even third generation Americans, uh, Arab Americans, who have made a life for themselves in the United States. Uh, the State Department uh, recognizes the essential role that the Arab American community has had in shaping the history of the United States uh, as a diverse and inclusive society for all, regardless of faith or country of origin. Um, for many uh, Arab Americans, identity and culture play a big factor in their lives. Uh, but for some, the immersion of Western culture uh, has altered their Middle Eastern practices and their traditions. So the virtual panel uh, tonight, we probe uh, the ways in which Arab Americans have diffused uh, their traditions into America uh, and have balanced their cultural identities in a globalizing society. So once again, thank you to our panelists for joining us. Uh, we will be, Kimberly will take us through some introductions uh, and uh, all the best everyone. Looking forward to some great discussions tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and I am super excited to be introducing these great panelists today. Um, everybody has kind of a different background in uh, different sorts of fields and careers. So that's super exciting for us to uh, understand their experiences, especially being Arab American and how they're able to navigate through these careers and different occupations with their multicultural background. So um, first, I would like to introduce Dr. Issam Hegi. Um, Dr. Issam Hegi is the uh, chief scientist of Qatar Environment and Energy Research Institute at Hamad Ben Khalifa University and Qatar Foundation, and the program research director of its newly established Earth Science Program. He was telling us a little bit about his research and kind of his uh, interest in space and especially like uh, different planets and things. So it's really cool and he has a really cool background. So um, he's a really cool panelist to get to know today. Um, and also his research, um, he's also the research scientist at the Vertebe School of Engineering and the, in the University of S Southern California and the affiliate of the Radar Science and Engineering section of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm sorry if I'm butchering that, but as I said, really cool things that he's been doing. So um, definitely excited to have Isam on the panel tonight. Um, and we also have our next panelist, Lu A. Um, and Lou A, a little bit of background about him. It, he is the Associate Director of the International Program at the Film Independent 
and he oversees a diverse slate of international programs with diverse global partners. He produced the Global Media Maker Summit in Cairo and the educational web series Film Arabi that equips aspiring Arab filmmakers with the tools to tell their own stories. And he's currently in uh, Los Angeles, which I think is super cool. He's in the home of film and media. So he definitely has some expertise about that. Um, and uh, he also is a director of digital media at the Bainuna uh, Media Group in Abu Dhabi, developing content for the digital platforms. And he has was story consultant on the award-winning female-centric feature film, Solitaire, and the Canadian film, Peace by Chocolate. All right, so our next panelist is Sahar Al Ansari. Um, you may know her as Everything Mama um, Qatar on Instagram. She has an immense following. Um, she comes from a mixed American Qatari background. She is a mother of two children. She is the founder of Everything Baby, a baby essential online store, which a lot of Qataris would know. Um, Sahar tries to better her community by helping other parents go through parenting skills with her uh, daily basis, with her blogs, Everything Mama, and her TikToks and Instagram. Um, her blog aims to spread positivity to other parents and to help them cope with and enjoy being a parent, which is so important, especially when you're raising um, multicultural kids or just kids in general. Um, so that is really exciting to have Sahar here as well. And our last panelist is Aya Abunaba. She is um, personally my friend, but it's great to have her as a panelist here today. Um, she is a first generation Muslim American, uh, Arab American, and comes from an ethnically Palestinian background. She is currently completing her undergrad in public health on a pre-PA track to the University of South Florida. Having worn the hijab for from a young age, she has always questioned about her identity and her background, but she's able to push past those boundaries and to make a name for herself, especially in her career, as well as just individuality. Um, and transitioning into a more career-oriented environment within the healthcare system has been influenced by her presence as an Arab American here in the United States. So it's also great to have a young mind in our panel today to share kind of the new generation experiences of Arab Americans and kind of, you know, just the experiences that people go through. So without further ado, let us get into the questions. So I have a few questions that we have kind of just um, generally made um, and we're gonna propose to everyone. Um, and I would like to be able to um, get everybody's feedback and experiences on these questions. So let us get into that. And then at the end of our questions, we're gonna have a, a point in our Zoom where we're going to allow for question and answers from our audience. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to write those down and we will get through those in, um, at the end of our just little questionnaire thing. Okay, so our first question is, were there any challenges growing up as an Arab American? And if so, can you explain them and relay how you were able to overcome said challenges? So um, I'm asking our panelists, I'm not sure uh, who wants to start, but if you guys have any sort of commentary on that, feel free to uh, speak your piece. I can go ahead and start. Um, so kind of in regard to some of the challenges I faced as being an Arab American, um, I think I could start with the fact that because America is such a diverse place and we have people coming in from many different backgrounds, backgrounds we also do have to realize that there is an aspect of, um, you know, a white majority here in the States as well. So obviously some people are not exactly keen to um, understanding other cultures as we may necessarily know. So a lot of the challenges I think has been with education. 
to kind of overcome a lot of the ignorance and stuff like that, that people um, kind of come across as when they're trying to meet you. And a part of that is because a lot of people just genuinely don't know. And I, I think the first thing that I'm usually faced with is like, where are you from? So, and I have faced this a lot more recently. I work in, in um, ophthalmology groups, so cataract surgery. These are older generations of people of different backgrounds, and they don't necessarily, they've never maybe necessarily encountered a hijabi, a young hijabi woman whose English is perfect and um, maybe like, it, it seems a little more modern in the sense. So they'll always ask, well, like, where are you from? And I always have to start with, well, I was born and raised here. However, ethnically, I'm Palestinian, and my parents are from Palestine, and I have a very strong connection to Palestine because I don't like to leave that out of my identity because it's played such an important role. But I think one of the challenges is that people come to you with a certain expectation and um, trying to kind of separate yourself from that expectation and from who you truly are and being able to relay that to people in a way that makes them feel like their questions are being answered as well is, is definitely an interesting thing to maneuver. But once you get the hang of it, you start to kind of see through people and realize that some people just are genuinely curious. And um, coming, you know, es establishing yourself as a certain person may intrigue their interest to learning more about your background and open doors for, for them to, you know, truly become more culturally competent people. So I think if that answers your question, Kimberly, is some of the challenges I faced. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And um, it was really great hearing about that. So does anybody else have any sort of comments on that? Sure, um, I think it also depends where you grow up in the United States. The United States is a large country. Um, uh, very diverse and different uh, I think people have different experiences in different parts of the country and also um, you know Arab Americans are also a large and diverse group so it's also there's this misconception that all Arabs are alike or ethnically or religiously alike and I think so we have different experiences um, I grew up in Texas. My experience was uh, a little bit different than Ayas because I actually have an accent. So it wasn't the way I looked. I, um, the way I looked wasn't really the issue. It was more, why do I have this accent? Where is this accent from? So I think we have, um, in a way, similar experiences with Aya, but for different reasons. Um, um, so I just wanted to bring this up. And also with the Arab Americans, um, you know, it also depends whether you're first generation, second generation, third generation. Um, there's also this assumption that if we are Arab Americans, we all, you know, speak Arabic. And um, while a lot of us do, um, some don't. Um, and uh, some of us are more in touch with, um, you know, the, our relatives or um, relations, you know, back where our parents came from and others have lost that. So we are a very large, diverse group, just like any immigrant group in the United States. I mean, some Arab Americans started immigrating to the United States in the mid 1800s. So their connection with the Arab world, you know, has been lost. Um, so we just have to keep that in mind as well. No, thank you for that. Yes, yes, Kimberly, if I may say so. I wasn't born in the U.S., but I came at a young age, at the age of uh, 25, 24 years old, 23 years old. So um, I do have an accent. I do look Middle Eastern, and I came during the 9-11 time. And uh, I came in Texas, and I, when I moved to Texas, was my first landing place in Houston. I came with a lot of fear and a lot of stigma about how Muslims are treated, about the difference, all of that. Uh, and this is not to make a promotion for anybody, but my years in Texas have shown me that fear is the worst enemy of being a part of the society. All my fears were not founded. And even if I look and I do have an accent, uh, I worked in NASA and NASA changed my life. And uh, through innovation and through dedication to hard work, uh, I was able to have a normal life 
and a chance that I would never had the chance in, uh, to, to, to do in my life. Uh, when I became a US citizen, somebody asked me, how do you feel about now you have the passport, US passport? So I don't have a passport. I have a, a citizenship. I am a citizen. I don't carry a passport. I carry something in my heart to the place that teach me a lot, that host me for 20 years, that when I did my first family, my first job, it's just not a passport. And so in, when I travel to the Middle East, people have this image that if you naturalize an American, that you're a half American. And I always tell them the difference between me and someone who's born American, that I earned it being a US citizen and somebody else inherited he inherited something he did not choose. I cho choose to be that person. And uh, I, I, I really want to keep that, that whatever background, whatever identity, uh, something that is very clear about uh, growing as a young person in the US, that I learned to, to give the chance to those who are younger people. And that's what I do today with my students that are from all around the globe. Yeah, I have to agree with Dr. Isam, um, it's not only a passport. I came to the United States as a teenager and lived as a resident for many years, but um, I would forget that I'm not an American until I had to travel and use my Lebanese passport. So when I got the um, American passport, it was more than just a passport. I had already identified as an American living here. If I can add something, I actually had the complete opposite um, experience being brought up, born and brought up here in Doha. Uh, it was actually the opposite because people would see me and they'd be like, no way are you from here? Like, what's the story? <laughs> so it's the exact same thing, but just in, re in like reverse. And uh, when I'd say like, oh, I'm half American, they'd be like, oh, how does it feel to be half American? Like, how does it feel that your mom's American? And I would think like, I would actually think hard and be like, I don't know, feels pretty normal, you know? <laughs> so I think it's also a different stigma, like growing up here is uh, when they heard my mom's American, they immediately assumed that my mom is like super open-minded, super okay with anything, that like we wouldn't be following the culture. We wouldn't like identify with our Arab side at all. Um, so I think we kind of changed that idea uh, living here and kind of, like being in the culture, being in the religion, being in everything, but we also brought our American side to it. And funny enough, I married somebody that actually grew up in the States. He lived there for about 12 years, all of his childhood. So uh, in the end of the day, I guess we just gravitate towards others, you know, especially uh, when you have the American in you, like you can't take it, you can't take it. It's just, it's an identity. It's always gonna be there, whether you have the passport or not. Oh my gosh, thank you guys so much. <laughs> Sorry, Aya, did you want to say something? I was actually going to build on what Zahra said because I think that our positions are very, um, very parallel, but kind of reflective on one another. So kind of like growing up here, being American is something that I truly like I resonate with because that's my that's kind of how I grew up that's my culture but I was kind of forced into it because I did wear hijab at a very young age so people immediately questioned me so I was kind of forced in a position where I was like okay well all these people actually don't identify me as just a regular teenage girl going to high school you know what I mean there's always something more where are you from what's your religion like oh you guys do this you guys do that and I would have to correct these people so establishing a very strong sense of self at a very young age was insane because nobody knows themselves at such a young age so having the answers to these extremely uh you know leveled questions is um, very interesting. So I, I, I commend also Noai and Sam for their experiences because you know my parents had exactly their experiences. They came here at a younger age, had to assimilate into a culture and a society that didn't necessarily accept them for who they were. Um, you know, my parents had accents or they were in professional settings where people didn't necessarily respect them just on the basis of their intelligence, where they had to prove themselves in a way that, you know, other people didn't necessarily need to so it was like they had the privilege of just being who they were and came as they are while you know m my parents as an example had to work twice as hard just to get to where they are so it's you know it, it is a very unique experience to say the least so it's kind of very interesting to hear everybody 
Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. I definitely learned a lot, especially because I don't have, you know, the experiences that you guys have. But um, my mom is actually um, also an immigrant and um, she had similar experiences with trying to prove herself. You know, I mean, she does come from Germany, which is pretty much like a Western country, but it's still kind of that aspect of, you know, she doesn't really like know the culture and trying to assimilate into such a different culture. It can be tough sometimes, and especially trying to uh, showcase your skills and abilities in work fields is uh, can be challenging. So I definitely um I applaud you guys for sharing your experiences and also um, being able to triumph those challenges. So um, let us get into our second question. Um, so this one's a little bit more of a fun one. Who was your greatest influence growing up as an Arab American? So this can be, you know, um, your parents per se, any family members, if you want to say, you know, um, you know, uh, your favorite singer, artist or anything, anybody who influenced you in a positive way that kind of helped build your character, maybe also your um, love for your different cultural identities. If I can start, um, I would probably say I don't have one person that I look up to, but it's just uh, really helpful and it helps inspire me when I meet people that have the same background as me and that can understand me because we don't feel like we belong to, to Qatar. We don't feel like we belong to America. Like we feel lost in the middle because we feel like both of the both countries are our identity. So it's inspiring and it's very helpful uh, to find people that are in the same like situation or people that are like-minded people that go through the same thing as us whether it's pros or cons so I think it's really important like to be able to go through life in a very nice way to find people that you resonate with um like for me um I've always been interested in storytelling so um, when I moved to the United States uh, as a young teenager, I was surprised to find in the school library uh, books by Khalil Gibran, who I thought was you know, a Lebanese author. It turned out that he was actually Lebanese American. He had lived um, most of his uh, young life in between Boston and New York and his books were some of his books were originally written in English so he was definitely an inspiration especially uh, you know being a bilingual uh, person and um, having built a bridge between his uh, original country and his uh, new country I think if I can say um, from my world and in space and science, uh, definitely Dr. Uh, Hamad Zouail, the receiver of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1999, was an Egyptian American, has been inspiring for a whole generation. Uh, Dr. Farouk al Baz, who was a NASA scientist in, in the Apollo program. So the scientist, the Arab American scientist, has been a motor of energizing the love for science an education for hundreds of, uh, I would say for hundreds of thousands, for millions of people in uh, my native country in Egypt and even beyond in the Arab world. Very true. And also Hassan Kamel Sabah, who I yeah. believe was a uh, scientist in the United States. And the Charles Al Ashi, who was the director of JPL, I think the influence of Arab American scientists has been uh, so powerful in the Middle East and really shaped the image of the United States. For one instance, very simple example: uh, there are many federal agency in the government, uh, FBI, uh, others. There is one that has an an, an ultimate good image abroad, which is NASA. You can't find a single human being outside of the United States who would have a negative image of NASA. NASA is anonymously and globally uh, recognized with a very positive image. And it is the one of the most diverse uh, national uh, organization 
in the United States. Right. I definitely could see how those could be um, some important um, influences. Aya, did you have any um, input on that? Yeah, honestly, like you guys said, all these um, big name scientists and the people that kind of paved the way at, in their identity as being Arab Americans are so important, especially as someone who's going into the field um, of science is something I, I resonate with. I love medicine. I love healthcare. Um, so just seeing that others can do it and do it so successfully is just so motivating. But on a personal level, um, I think kind of like what Sahar said, having people that kind of share the same experiences as you, so you don't feel like a fraud. Because sometimes I think that's an aspect of it. You know, halfway I'll feel, well, I'm so American, but at the same time, like I'm a Palestinian at the end of the day. So I, I, I want to connect with those roots, but I want to stay true to who I actually grew up to be. Um, but somebody who truly like resonated with that throughout my life was my aunt. Um, and she's kind of like similar, uh, like she kind of acted as an older sister to me growing up. And just those experiences that I felt like, you know, especially dealing with first generation immigrant parents and their introduction to a new world and raising children in this new place um, and their struggle to make sure that we had you know, some form of identity and that we were set in a path to be successful. It's harder to have, you know, your parents understand you just so to have my aunt kind of lead way for that and, and let, you know, kind of let me be in touch with my American side as well as being true to my Arab side as well. She played such a big role for that for me. And like till now, I am so appreciative of that. And she continues to kind of mentor me in that way. So, yeah. Yes, I love that. I love that. And I am so glad that you guys were able to find, you know, these outlets of influence, especially because I think that when we do kind of um, idolize these people, it also kind of gives us an inspiration and an aspiration to kind of, you know, pursue our, our interests, pursue our goals, and to just kind of, you know, make a name for ourselves in this big world. So it's amazing that you guys um, experiences with that. So moving on to our next question, um, this goes a little bit along the lines of the um, second question. To what extent has your culture and identity propelled your interest in certain occupational fields? So I know that you guys uh, talked a little bit about that, um, but if you guys kind of want to um, explain a little bit more, or maybe there was other outside influences um, that kind of helped you choose whatever sort of career you're in, or um, you know whether you're an entrepreneur, scientist, filmmaker, PA student, you know anything. What were your interests, or what were kind of the driving factors in that? Can start when it comes to. Uh filmmaking, um, you know, moving to the United States, I was surprised. Um, well, I moved at a time when television and movies were not as inclusive as they are today. But despite that, I found that a lot of Arab Americans, especially Lebanese Americans, uh, made it in front of the screen. Um, for the most part, they were not playing um, Arab Americans, um, they were playing Americans of European descent, such as Danny Thomas, and later his daughter, Marlo Thomas, um, Jamie Farr. Well, Jamie Farr was an exception. He did play on MASH, a Lebanese American character. Um, and, um, but slowly you would see some, you know, changes with that here and there with Kathy Najimi, you know, playing some, uh, Lebanese American characters. So that kind of like encouraged me that uh, there is a place and, uh, you know, and then you'd have larger um, or bigger stars also uh, coming from um, South America with Lebanese descent, like Salma Hayek and Shakira and all of these people making it in the film, television and music industry in the United States. Um, for the most part, um, Arab Americans were able to, um, be on the screen uh, like a lot of other 
ethnic minorities, um, you know, they often changed their names. And like I said, played uh, people of European descent. Um, but after 9-11, I think this changed a lot, especially since, um, you know, a lot of uh, Arab Americans who um, come from different regions of the Arab world where they are not able to play the roles of Europeans found it much harder to find roles other than the very stereotypical and, and often negative portrayals of Arabs. And, um, you know, for those who are interested in that, there's a really good book by um, Jack Shaheen called Real Bad uh, Arabs, How Hollywood Vilifies People. Uh, you can uh, learn a lot about uh, how Arab representation been very stereotyped in um, American media. Uh, however, recently we have seen some um, uh, positive uh, portrayals uh, like Rami Youssef in his Hulu series of uh, Muslim Americans. So this wasn't, so a lot of people say that this is like the first Arab American or the first show that features an Arab American uh, family. And it's actually more specific. We've seen Arab Americans on TV before, but this is more specific because it's also portraying a Muslim uh, American family. And I think it's very unique in that um, uh, fact. And then uh, just a few weeks ago, um, uh, Disney released its uh, newest um, Marvel series. And for the first time, it is directed by an um, Arab American, Egyptian filmmaker, Muhammad Yab. So if you haven't seen it, check out Moon Knight. And it is really interesting, interesting because it's the first time that a series or a film that depicts Egypt in any way or Egyptology is actually directed by an Egyptian. So it's, I think it's unique. So, um, you know, slowly these things are changing in Hollywood too. If I can, talk, I can talk about the field of space science and it's different than many other fields in science because it has technology de development that sometimes it is classified, sometimes it is tangential to military. So you have uh, some rules like ITAR who prohibit uh, foreign national from working on some specific technology uh, development. So when I came in 2001, uh, and the times were very bad, 9-11 was there. The Arab community had a very negative image uh, and uh, but neither the, neither the less uh, something that is very unique to America, that being American is somehow having a dual heritage. Every single person on this land has a dual heritage from somewhere because we are all descendants of immigrants. So it's not a shame to feel to have this dual heritage. And that helped a lot. When it helped, when, when it came these times where it was difficult to get to my office in NASA, it's very difficult to participate in project. It's all those who, who preceded me and they were from Europe. So they were from Germany who explained it to me that 50 years ago, it was being German or being Japanese in, uh, on a NASA campus was, was horrible. And, we, uh, and it was very difficult. Today is, is being Arab, tomorrow is being something else. And so these things are like waves. They come and they go ups and down. And something for sure that these difficulties, they never disappear. But our society is uniquely positioned to treat these ups and downs and to question them and not to take them as, as granted and as fact. Unfortunately, where I come from the Middle East, uh, we, have the, we have more discrimination even against each other, the colors, religion, all of that. And we call all of that uh, enigmatic world of uh, disaccord, if not to call it something else, we call it tradition. And we, we, are, we just so fear to change it. If for one thing, the US has become a power, it's the only nation that has this ability to question itself and to change the things that need to change. It's the only nation I lived in, and I lived in France and Egypt, two nations with long history, but both of them defined their identity from history. America defined its identity from the future. That's why it is a powerful, and it will stay more powerful because it propels itself 
where we should be and not where our ancestor was. Yeah, I have to agree with Dr. Um, Islam. Uh, a lot of the immigrant communities, um, when they first are, start arriving in the United States, they are uh, facing uh, discrimination. I mean, Italian Americans went through very similar um, experiences at the turn of the 20th century when they started arriving in New York City. Um, Arab Americans arrived uh, for the mo most part, uh, starting the mid 1800s and the early 20th century from Lebanon and Syria. They were uh, majority uh, coming from Christian communities, so they were able eventually to assimilate into the larger, you know, um, so populations and they looked like other Mediterranean groups that were immigrating to this region. This changed, this experience was completely different, let's say for immigrants later on in the 20th century from Yemen, Iraq, elsewhere in the Arab world um, where you know they had different experiences. But I also um, wanna just point out something that there's this misconception that Arabs are also, it's for Arab immigrants, it's hard for them to assimilate in the United States. And I uh, have to disagree with that. A lot of us come from large cities, whether it's Beirut or Cairo or Alexandria, Damascus and Baghdad, that are very metropolitan, cosmopolitan, with, um, with um, very diverse cities. So we are used to living in cities with a lot of diversity. So it's not nothing, it's not new to Arab Americans for the most part to move to the United States and you know mix with other people. So I just wanted to point that out. I kind of wanted to pay regard to a, a lot of the things that you and um, Dr. Sam mentioned in regard to the discrimination. I think that Kind of like you said, there has been groups before us and minorities before us that have come, that have started off as first generation into second generation, into third generation, and who have pretty much assimilated into their society. But I think what, like, like what Dr. Isam said, we question the flaws in our society. And I think that's a very important thing. Yes, we may be very flawed. There is aspects of American culture and, and the way that we do things, whether it's healthcare, whether it's the police system, whether it's discrimination, all these different aspects, whether it's our education system, that are, you know, they have their flaws, but we are very outspoken about them. And as a society, we, like you said, we question it. We don't let that just pass. And I think that, um, when I do go back home and stuff like that, I recognize that tradition is so deeply rooted that people are not, you have to, you have to be uncomfortable to change, to grow. That's the only way for growth to occur. You have to be in a state of discomfort and, um, and necessarily not like not in your comfort zone, but they are so deeply rooted in comfort and, and their own tradition that, you know, maybe society isn't being propelled in that way. What, whereas here, Yes, we go through a lot of discrimination and prejudice and aspects that degrade certain minority groups in our country, but in order for them to, in the next 50 years, for it to be normalized, it's like putting the rest of society in a, in a shock, in a shock factor, bringing in this new group of people so that, you know, we can grow as a society. So I do appreciate that in regard um, to what uh, Dr. Issam and uh, no, I mentioned. So yeah, it's very interesting. All right. Thank you everyone for sharing your experiences. Um, I wanted to open up the panel to some of the questions and uh, that some of our audience have. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, text in the chat or to um, reply to the Facebook Live. Um, and we'll be happy to use the last 15 minutes to uh, go over some of these audience questions. All right, so we do have a question from Nihal. Um, she asks, does your reflection on identity change when you visit your families in other countries or in your home country? 
kind of want to start this off because I immediately started laughing. Um, I, I do visit, I do visit, alhamdulillah, Palestine pretty often and Jordan and I have dual heritage, dual citizenship. So that's another, another aspect. I have a citizenship with Palestine, I have citizenship with Jordan, and I have citizenship here in America. And um, when I do go back home, they all have a tendency to say pretty much in Arabic, and it's a very interesting question. Obviously, we're just going to reply to be able to feed into what they want to hear and stuff like that. But the identity is very interesting. Um, I feel like it's a temporary thing that's being fulfilled when I go back home. That sense of, yes, at the end of the day, I'm still Arab and, and maybe coming from a Muslim majority country, like that's very fulfilled in the sense when I do return. But at the end of the day, my life style, the people that I associate, I love the diversity. I love coming across new people. I love utilizing my different languages with different people and coming across different um, uh, different individuals with experiences that you could never imagine. And that's something that is so uniquely American in the sense that we're so open about it. Um, and so everybody's almost rooted in their in their backgrounds and in, in the way that they uh, present themselves in, in expression. So yes, I love my home, like my home country. And um, I think that's always gonna be a part of me, but at the same time, I, I love the life that I can potentially see myself building here as well. And that's something I can't neglect. Um, I think if I were to reply to this question, I would say uh, being from um, a multi-cultural uh, background, um, we can adapt pretty much everywhere, <laughs> which is definitely a plus. So I feel like when I'm around my family, my Qatari family, I feel like I, I can fit in like really well. I mean, it takes a bit of effort, uh, but at the same time, when I'm with my American family, it's, it's very easy to adapt. And I think that's something, um, that's a skill that not a lot of people have. And you really have to be di like have a diverse background to be able to adapt to whatever situation you're in. And I feel like we're blessed for that. Uh, but I, I don't feel like I belong anywhere. I feel like I belong everywhere, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, I mean, I'm much older than Sahara and Aya, so uh, my experience is a little bit different. Um, actually, what I, you know, because I, when I would go back to Lebanon, I actually noticed that um, society in Lebanon was much more liberal than the, let's say, Lebanese or Arab American community in uh, Dallas, Texas, where I grew up. And I think it's because some immigrant communities, when they come, the new immigrants come, they hold on to tradition while society back home is evolving because societies always evolve. Uh, no society stays the same, otherwise we'd all still live in caves. Um, and But I think some immigrant, immigrant communities, at least the parents try to hold on to the traditions longer than if they were living in, um, you know, their home countries where society is changing as a whole. Um, I think today it's completely different because of social media. Younger generations are connecting through um, social media globally. They are consuming the same kind of um, media, whether you live in uh, Los Angeles or Beirut or uh, Kathmandu. So I see that the, the nephews and nieces that live in the United States are not that identity wise are not that different than my nephews and nieces who still live in Beirut. So I think we're more connected and the global identity today is we have, you know, it's much more uh, in common uh, than before. If, if I may say uh, my input on that, uh, when I go back, to my home country and I haven't went back in eight years. Uh, I, I feel that I'm a man on a mission. And that mission is to try to make a difference. I don't identify myself with a dress or with an accent or with a dish or with any dress or, and I hate to be put in the box that I'm a conservative because I'm Muslim 
because Muslim are not historically conservative. Uh, so I feel that I am on a mission to try to make as much change as I can to give to my homeland the same uh, chance and education and knowledge as it exists in the United States. I try to do this in my field in space science, environmental science, and climate science. There should be no human living in our modern area who does not know about how climate can change our life, how our, envi how our environment is degrading so fast. Today, uh, that's, I feel, the mission I, I, I want to do. I really do not care a lot if people look at me and say, oh, you changed because you are in the U.S. or, uh, or you have an accent when you speak in Arabic and you have an accent when you speak in English. I don't really, I'm not interested if they see that I belong here or I belong there. I'm only interested to make the change in their life. Because if I can make that change, that's when I become really Egyptian and can really American. I really liked your answers with that. And I, um, I really appreciate your experiences with everything, especially because, you know, family can be a really tough uh, deal, especially when, you know, you're trying to um, make sure that, you know, you let your family know that you're doing good and all of your endeavors are actually, you know, um, you know, bearing the fruits of your labor. And so I uh, definitely commend you guys for, you know, sharing your experiences and also um, being able to uh, adapt well to certain situations. Um, so we have another question. Um, do you think your diverse background gives you empathy when interacting with others from a different background than yours? I was actually asked this a similar question, um, like one of my friends needed to interview me for a behavioral health care paper and um, using kind of like my background and um, my experiences so far, I think that the world, word cultural competency is very important. Growing up as someone who is necessarily was viewed as a minority or um, a little bit different than the rest of my peers, I think that I have grown with such a sense of empathy towards other people and wanting to ensure that they get the best out of what I can offer them so that they leave my experience like leave an experience or an interaction with me um, with a more positive outcome than they than they entered with it so in that case like I said I work in healthcare and I think that's so important because the future of healthcare can be can grow so much if if our generation really understood cultural competency. And when they kind of took the blinds off of discrimination or preconceived notions and expectations of people and just saw them for just people. And that, that can change the traje trajectory of how our society moves completely. Um, so yeah, like disregarding anything else and just seeing people for who they are and also being intelligent enough to understand that the reason people like interact or pe why people the way are the way that they are, excuse me, is because sometimes of their cultural background. So if you're more sensitive to that, you can be able to help these people in a more effective way. If someone comes and they're, um, you know, Jehovah's Witness and they want to get a blood transfusion and or they necessarily need a blood transfusion, but you know that that's something that they can't necessarily get because of their religious, um, you know, reservations with it. Being able to have those conversations and open up and make them feel comfortable, make them feel safe, give them other options so that they can still, at the end of the day, get the best type of treatment as possible. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. And that's just an example of what, how far we can go with that. But if someone's just, a doctor is just immediately going to get upset and be like, you're going to die without this and this and that, well, that patient no longer feels like they want to come to you for treatment. And we have failed at the end of the day as a, as a healthcare uh, provider. So that's just kind of from my healthcare scope of the matter. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Sahar, did you have anything else? No, I was just going to say, uh, definitely, I feel like um, when comparing people that are mixed backgrounds or people that have lived in two different cultures with people that have been in one culture, 
uh, you can definitely see the emotional intelligence that they have. Um, like, I feel like we, for us, things are like, like it, from your mind, it's like, yeah, of course, you're not going to say this to this person because you're, you're emotionally intelligent. You know that this, like, this will hurt somebody. Um, and I feel like growing up, knowing that and having empathy for others in that way, uh, it's definitely something different and not something you come by every single day. Like, uh, you don't just say the first thing that comes to your mind. You have to consider that that person has feelings and that person might come from a different background, might be like going through something. So I feel like coming from two different cultures or two different countries, you feel like you understand them more and you think twice before speaking. And uh, it gives you this emotional intelligence and empathy towards others. No, that's really beautiful. I like how you explained it. Think, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yes, Kimberly, I think one also, uh, we Arab American have compassion for those who have been in wars. For those who, who have been in dictatorship, for those who have been in places where they can't speak, and these places are 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 increasing around our planet. So, and as America is a land of welcoming new people coming from these area, the Arab community or the Arab American have a big role in helping that. We understand how the Ukrainian feel. We understand how uh, many people coming from conflict area, they feel because we've been through this, we lost homes, we have been di displaced. Some of us, like myself, could not even have a birth certificate because I was born in a time of war. So, so we know these things and many American who have not been, who are not Arab American, they don't realize how hard it is. And, and sometimes they think that, for instance, uh, some people who have some ra some radical thoughts would think that the Ukrainian would be very happy to move to Western Europe. They have this on a golden plate or to move to the to America. Nobody is happy to leave his home, even if that home is very rudimentary and poor. And they move to us, not because we're wealthy, but because we're safe. And that that's the first criteria for being in exile and having been on that situation myself, uh, uh, we are, I would say that Arab American playing, are playing and will play more important role in welcoming those who come from conflict zones into the United States. And often a lot of us uh, have more than just double identities coming from the Arab world. Um, you know, the Arab world, like I said earlier, is a very diverse place. We have especially the Levant and uh, in Egypt and North Africa, where we have ethnic minorities as well, like the Armenians and Circassians and the Kurds and all other like uh, minority ethnic ethnicities who also identify with being from the Arab world. So um, we often, I often meet people who, you know, carry these multiple identities um, with them. Um, I, I think it, and especially living in big cities in the United States, it's not a unique experience having a double identity. Um, you know, there are people who, um, you know, whether you're Latino or African or Asian American or um, uh, a child of immigrants, you, you automatically have these double identities. So I think it's not a unique experience to Arab Americans, but it, definitely I have to agree that, um, I think it, uh, it enriches uh, me personally, but also I think uh, it makes life a little bit more interesting when you're meeting people with these different uh, cultural backgrounds. And it makes the cities more interesting. Here in LA, I mean, we have the best cuisine because there's so much you know, uh, diverse uh, population. I just wanted to also um, regard one more thing, kind of how, something that is unique to being Arab American is our kind of, to put it frankly, our connection to war, as Dr. Assam said, we are known to be this terrorist group of people. And like, like these preconceived notions about us are very apparent. It's apparent in our media, it's apparent in the things that we digest on a daily basis. So being so, I, my, my grandparents were children of um, Nakba, which is one of the most, like one of the 
worst genocides. Uh, my, my, a lot of my friends are Syrian refugees. My family is in Palestine and undergoes, you know, a lot of violence, you know, monthly. So we are, we have such a, such a more sensitive approach to people because we recognize we have we have a, a deep rooted love for just humanity and peace and, and and craving that because our countries have been put through so much and to get into the details of why they've been put in is a whole other issue but at the end of the day this is the circumstances that they're in when everything happened in Aleppo when everything happened in all these countries all around um, North Africa and the Middle East we are directly connected to it no, we can't escape it and while our, our peers in other, way, other ways can. So that just makes us so much more uh, capable people in a sense. I think it, it draws strength and it draws humanity within us. And so I think that's beautiful. It's sad, but it's beautiful. All righty, thank you so much guys for um, sharing your thoughts on that question. Um, it was definitely really nice to hear from everyone and kind of get your feedback on it. Um, we are running into about five minutes left of our discussion. There are a few more questions. So um, I just wanted to ask if um, we could just keep the responses short for the next few questions, just so that way everybody can, you know, kind of get everything that they want to get off their chest. Um, and also, uh, so you guys have enough time at the end to um, share any sort of ways on how to connect with you guys. Um, if anybody has any more questions or, you know, if they are in your certain fields of expertise, um, you know, and um, yeah. So um, one of the questions that was posed is um, how do you intend to preserve your culture within your family considering uh, they might be uh, third generation? I don't know if that sounds confusing, it might. Um, maybe in the sense, how do you um, intend to preserve your culture just within um, a globalized society, especially to make sure that you're passing down these sort of traditions and experiences to your family and um, for the generations to come after that. Um, I Hi. think for- Okay, go sorry. ahead. No, no, go ahead. I think for us, what we do is uh, we try to incorporate it as much as we can during our like everyday life. And I think it's important to keep it there, you know, because um, my husband grew up in the States, as I told you, and it was very, very difficult for him to move back to Qatar after living outside for like about 28 years. Um, so it was a, a bit of a culture shock to come back to Qatar and to see like how much has changed and the culture and the religion and everything like everything was a culture shock so I feel like moving forward me and him we both had an understanding that we want our culture both cultures the American culture and the Qatari culture to be incorporated in their daily life uh, whether it's uh, giving us a hug and kiss to say goodbye before they leave or uh, reading the du'a in the morning or whatever you know like the small things that make a difference for us having lunch all of us together um, celebrating the the different holidays uh, a lot of people find it taboo to celebrate uh some of the american holidays but we uh, since a lot of our family is american we do believe that we should also respect their their cultures as well and their their celebrations as well and uh, so we kind of expose them to everything so that growing up they don't feel like anything is taboo they don't feel like anything is unacceptable uh and at the same time they know both cultures um, so that we don't lose any identity and they don't feel like they don't belong wherever they end up, whether they end up living in the States or they end up living here or in any country, they feel like they're able to cope with wherever they end up in life. I think we uh, preserve uh, culture uh, through the arts, through poetry and literature and music and songs and film, absolutely. I think uh, society and culture are ever evolving, but the arts help us uh, remember what they were at a certain time in human history. Um, while ancient Egyptian religion is no longer practiced, but we know about that society from what they left behind. So I think uh, the arts. 
Yeah, so, uh, you hear me? Yes. So I, th I think the big question is that why we preserve the culture. I mean, something we were born with it, we inherited. We, we hardly did any effort to get it. If we were born from China, we preserved Ch Chinese. So this whole uh, attitude of being so proud of something, we didn't do any effort to get it. A little bit outpassed me for many of my uh, of my people. I think I would say in my case why I preserve the culture is for one reason, because I want my family, my kids, to be able to connect to these people in the Middle East where we come from, to help them evolve, to help them become more peaceful, to help them to catch with uh, the modern civilization, and it is under that framework that I believe that cultural preservation is important to provide progress to the nations where we come from and not just simply because I believe my culture is the best or even that there is a glory in preser preserving a heritage that I didn't do anything of, of uh, in building it. I mean, I'm Egyptian. I did not make the Nile River flow. I did not construct the pyramids. Uh, and none of that. And probably I don't speak Pharaoh. I don't recognize the hieroglyph and uh, including 99% of my fellow Egyptians are like this, but yet we are so proud of this. We should be proud of our role, of what we can give in the future to these countries who need help at the most. Hi, Aya, did you have anything else that you wanted to um, kind of expand on? I think just to kind of preserve the culture in my, um in my future generations to come if I'm blessed with that is to kind of allow them to be raised the way that I was where it was like building a strong sense of self and letting them kind of maneuver the world as they see fit and come across so many people of different and diverse backgrounds and um and letting them have an input and having a seat at every table that they come across because I think that my parents gave me that opportunity um and that's kind of it and kind of like what Sahara said it was it's it's the little things it's like we go to Eid together and we have Eid breakfast and we we see our families and we have ma'azumas ma and the same thing like I'm carrying it here I live an hour and a half away from my family but yesterday I held a huge iftar with all my friends just because I felt like that's the culture that I was raised upon and it makes me feel safe and makes me feel proud of where I come from and um I just hope to carry that on for my kids and for you know, the younger generation below me. Alrighty, so we are going to wrap up our discussion. It was really lovely to have everybody here, especially, um, you know, sharing your expertise, sharing your experiences, um, and just being honest and open about, you know, these situations, because it can be tough to talk about, especially, um, you know, as um, more uh, conflict and things can um, ensue. So um, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you guys uh, would like to put any sort of, um, um, if you guys wanna talk about any of your uh, panels or any other things that you guys are doing, any of your endeavors, um, or also maybe like LinkedIn so people can connect with you, um, maybe Instagram handles, um, anything that, you know, can kind of uh, give to the uh, people in um, that are listening to the live if you guys want to uh, just kind of, you know, any final remarks. When it That's comes to film fine. independent, our flagship uh, program is Global Media Makers, which is uh, in partnership with the uh, State Department's Education and Cultural Affairs Office um, uh, Bureau, where we actually uh, bring filmmakers uh, from across the globe, including countries in the Arab world, mid-career filmmakers who've made several short films or uh, at least one feature to a residency in LA to develop their uh, projects and development. So if you feel that you um, would be interested in such a residency, you can check out our website at filmindependent.org and go to the Global Media Makers page.
Um, if you'd like to follow me, sorry, Aya. <laughs> Um, if you'd like to follow me on Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat, it's everythingmama.qa. And I also have an uh, all baby essential store uh, for moms and babies essentials uh, called Everything Baby on Instagram. And it's just the same thing for the website. Thank you for having me today. I don't have a, a very big platform on Instagram, but if anybody wants to follow me, it's going to be A-A-Y-A-A-X-X. -A -A -X -X. And I'm always open to networking and just having discussions and just meeting other people. So yeah, thank you so much, Kimberly. This was a beautiful panel. Yes, Kimberly, many thanks for also for having me. And uh, I have my Facebook uh, page, Isam uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, I share the science and the, some of the importance between the link between science and the Arab society. And I welcome comments and inputs and so from everybody. Thank you. All right, so to wrap up our discussion, um, I just have a few remarks from um, my mentor, Samantha Jackson. So um, she can wrap us up and just give us concluding um, remarks on our discussion panel today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I wanted to say a special thanks to all of our panelists for sharing your experiences as Arab Americans in the United States and just to talk really candidly about your perspective and what you've experienced. Uh, now at the State Department and our, at our US Embassy, we acknowledge and celebrate and commemorate Arab American Heritage Month. And we are excited uh, that you all have been able to set time out of your busy schedules to share with us uh, your experiences, as well as your outlets of influence that have helped you to defy expectations, challenge uninformed and ill-informed myopic perspectives about Arab American identity. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, we talked a lot about different themes of dual heritage. I heard uh, conversations about dual citizenship and that everyone in the United States has that dual heritage if we go back in lineage um, and making these connections. Uh, thank you all for talking about reflections on your different, you know, your identity and problematizing the idea of what Arab American means um, and not keeping it limited to one thing as it's very nuanced. Uh, we talked about assimilation challenges emotional intelligence and its importance in understanding and connecting with one another. We talked about empathy, belongingness, feeling like you do belong, feeling like you, are, you belong to the world, and then also feeling like you are struggling to still fit in um, in, an, in a nation and in a world um, where, where, where many of us are overcoming adversities. Thank you for talking about and connecting about the Arab identity and also connecting it with understandings of war and challenges. Um, as I mentioned before, this month we are celebrating and acknowledging National Arab American Heritage Month. Uh, and so it, it's really great to hear your experiences and then to tie it in with the vast contributions of Arab, Arab Americans in the United States, um, within the Department of State, uh, within our US government, um, and also the contributions that they have made specifically in advancements we talked earlier on in science, in education, in business, technology, foreign policy, national security. Uh, these are really important uh, discussions to be had uh, this month and every single month, not just limited to April. Um, you heard earlier in the introduction and in the opening remarks by my colleague, Daniel, that the United States is home to more than 3.5 million Arab Americans, and they represent Arab Americans represent a diverse array of cultures, right? Uh, uh, traditions, um, ethnic backgrounds, and so there's not one identity, right? There's many different identities, and we're glad that you all came together to be able to share your experiences with us and those who are tuning in um, virtually from all over. Uh, and we just want to say thank you very much to you all. Um, we support you and we're really happy that you have voiced your experiences, your challenges uh, to help others to understand what you have gone through and then perhaps even inspire those listening. So thank you very much. I want to also thank our, our moderator, 
Kimberly, thank you so much. You did a wonderful job. And everyone here that has supported at our US Embassy and our public affairs section, uh, thank you so much for all the hard work that you've put into this. Nihel, Asil, Tracy, everyone. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in with us.